uh, what was your first exposure to Guns N' Roses? My first exposure to Guns N' Roses? You know, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about why I even got into them. I'm pretty sure I just heard the name Guns N' Roses mm-hmm. and instantly fell in love with that and just decided whatever music Guns N' Roses makes, that's yeah. what I'm going to like. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember um, going to Walmart and talking my mom into buying me Appetite for Destruction, even though it said warning explicit lyrics. And it didn't have the one that said like parental advisory specific explicit lyrics it had like a an older style one that like yeah. was like a paragraph about it she's like i wonder what this even means and i was like oh it's probably nothing <laughs> yeah and then she had me and my cousin jesse listen to it and she's like well tell me if there's any swears in it and we listened to the whole thing and i honestly didn't hear any swears but obviously there are swears yeah not too many though but, uh, I, 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 it's I guess, not too bad yeah it's not what, like what, you know, eminem or something yeah what year was that was that right after when it just come out this would have been 1992, so like five okay. years after, which seemed like a long time at the time, but in hindsight, yeah, pretty recently after. But yeah. Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 were definitely also already oh, out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mine, uh, I, so I actually, this is impressive. This really surprised me. I got actually into Guns N' Roses before you did. Uh, I, I have like a recollection of being, I don't know how young I was, but like I was born in 87. And th- there was a trip to Florida that, like, my family, my family, my mom and dad, and my my mom's brother took uh, so my uncle down to Florida. And I have a distinct recollection of being in a car seat and listening to Paradise City and like kicking my legs. And I can see like my little baby feet, you know what I mean, just freaking out and loving this thing, and everyone being really like amused at the fact that I was so into this music. So I got an early uh, introduction to that kind of thing. So it's kind of a preordained. Oh, nice for me. The band that I was really into when I was like two or three was the Guess Who. Oh, really? And I really liked the song No Time, uh-huh. which is still a great song to this day, and I still love the Guess Who, but not as much as Guns N' Roses. Yeah. That's for sure. So, so yeah, I, I heard them, so I was aware of them, I guess, you know, early, but I didn't really get back into them again big time until um, probably like, I don't know, sometime in the early 2000s, 2005, 2006. That's when I started listening to ACDC and all that, you know? And of course, Appetite for Destruction I knew about and I, you know, wore that out. I mean, Welcome to the Jungle and uh, Paradise City, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but sure. Then, if I never heard Paradise City again, I'd be fine with it. <laughs> I like the live version now, which is what always happens. I listen to these things so much in the studio, then I get like the live era, you know? And yeah. once you hear the live versions of things, like the studio almost doesn't have the same, it seems kind of empty in comparison. Yeah, they're two different animals for sure. For a long time, I hated listening to recorded live music. Yeah. And then recently, I've been a lot more into it. And and it's different. You know, it doesn't... It, Axel especially does not sound as good live. Yeah. It takes a lot of liberties. Right. But uh, it's definitely different. And, and I enjoy seeing them play it live. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's it's difficult to do his kind of, uh, I mean, that, that that vocal range to do that live and, and with the kind of like upbeat tempo of the live recordings, you know? But I kind of like that stuff. Like, I love uh, Brian Johnson, like his raspy voice that's all gravelly and really terrible. I mean, you know, people, a lot of people really don't like it, but I like it the more kind of worn in it sounds, which might account for some of my uh, preferences for the live stuff. What's your favorite song off of uh, Appetite, would you say, having listened to it for so long? Night Train. Yeah, I actually oh, yeah. put that. I put that to a, a a poll on on Facebook a couple of years ago. I remember, and the, I was looking to see how many people agreed that Night Train was. But don't get me wrong, I love It's So Easy, My Michelle, Rocket Queen. Yeah. Uh, Out to Get Me is good. For some reason, I've never have been into Mr. Brownstone. Is that right? And it seems like they play it. At like every live show too, and and I just am not a Mr. Brownstone fan. I'm a pretty big Mr. Brownstone fan, I must say. Okay, you know, yeah. I, I, like don't have any, I don't have anything against against you because of that. Yeah, I, I like the message. I think it's a good message. Just don't worry about anything. It's a waste of time. You know, you wake up yeah. kind of casually. You, know, you develop a heroin addiction. I mean, it's kind of you know. But you know what? The interesting thing about all their songs about um, 
particular like hard drug addiction and use is that it like Axel's whole mentality about not being able to be addicted to things or like refusing to have a habit, you know, really comes through because all the songs <laughs> always end up being about uh, quitting drug use, which is pretty interesting, I think. Axel is such an interesting person and I'm just fascinated by him. I don't know if you watched that video I sent you. I didn't watch the making of estranged. And there's one about November rain and one about don't cry. There's three hours of material out there of, of mostly Axel just musing about how insane he is. And, and the awesome thing about the estranged video was they play coma a lot in that video. They play double talk and jive quite a bit in that video. And it was just infused with so much other good guns and roses music and not like the, you know, sweet child of mine stuff, you know, yeah. that again, you know, I, I love sweet child of mine, but at the same time, if I never heard it again, I'd be completely fine with that. I will yeah. say whenever I hear my Michelle on the radio, that puts probably the biggest hop in my step. So I'm like, mm. nice. Like this, that's like a deep, deep cut. Yeah, I, I like that one too. That, that's pretty satisfying because it's got like his, uh, he's got that mix of, it's like an ambivalent kind of uh, emotion that comes through about, you know, some of it's vaguely misogynistic and then some of it, there's some, there's some affection in there and then there's some hostility. And then he, he, whoever he's speaking to or whoever the character is speaking to out of nowhere calls whoever she is a bitch and, and it's like a really angry tone. I like that yeah. kind of, and I, like, I appreciate that ambiguity. You know, I think it kind of goes with his personality. It goes with the music. Um, I'm actually, I like double talk and jive a lot too. I like it in the same way. I like Mr. Brownstone, just that kind of, uh, I don't know, really satisfying, uh, double uh, talk and jive is awesome. And on our ride up here last night, we drove up here two hours from where we live. And, uh, that's why I'm in a hotel room right now with Indian portraits on the wall. Mary looked up, uh, the set list that they've been playing. Yeah. And. They've been playing Coma, Double Talk and Jive, Estranged, which is fascinating to me. And we actually got tickets to go see them. Oh, did you? Uh, we're, I think we're going to go see them in uh, New Jersey. Okay. At the Meadowlands. But we also bought tickets to see uh, them in Chicago. But I'm not sure if we're going to go, if we're just going to sell those ones. But uh, they're playing in Foxborough, Mass, which is by far the closest to us, but it's on Tuesday, which doesn't work for us. So yeah, we're gonna I can't, to, we're going to have to take a trip. Hopefully Axel can make it. He already broke his foot, and... <laughs> which is pretty funny uh, performing from a throne. I feel like it's kind of a kind of hilarious, but, uh, I know yeah, I, him running around is so key. You know, uh, when I think of him in concert, I think of the live and let die video Yeah, and him the just sprint. like sprinting back and forth on the stage. Like that's what you want to see. And, just the fact that he's going to be fat Axel kind of already takes a bit of the shine off of it, but that's kind of hard to accept. Still is going to be awesome. I know he was so skinny, and it was kind of a Axel being skinny was such a a staple of my youth. Yeah, because you know, I was into them in ninety two, ninety three. I remember when they released the spaghetti incident and and all that, and I just remember being fascinated by how skinny he was, and then. Little I know he was going to eat himself into I mean, there was a that actual stage. There was a spaghetti incident, you know? Um, yeah, probably. I, you know what he looks like to me? And I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything really about, about it. But it looks like he's got that kind of like um, people, almost like Chevy Chase. You know what I mean? He says that he had got addicted to pain pills or something like that. And he has like, just kind of swollen look. It's not just like gained weight. It looks He looks kind of unwell. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's it's kind of weird to see having having you know, him having been so thin for so long. Absolutely. He definitely, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, that happens a lot, it seems like, to the, the, the guys that are really skinny for a long time. It was interesting, too, in that video about estranged, was Duff was very swollen at that time. And you're watching it, and you're thinking, oh, wow, look at Duff now. He's, he's really big. And then it's like, oh, no, this is Duff then. Yeah. Because Duff now is actually in great shape. Is that right? Have you ever watched the, the Velvet Revolver videos? I mean, he's a little scrawny, but other than that, it's like, whoa, I would probably trade. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, bl- swollen, that's exactly the term. It's not <laughs> It's not just heavy. There's a definite kind of swollen appearance. It just is really weird. Um, I think my, my favorite off of Appetite, if I had to pick one, would probably be Rocket Queen because I like the oh. – 
I'm, you know, I'm, I'm partial to the ballad segues, and I like that one because it's not really one or the other. Like, you know, November Rain kind of is ballad all the way through, and at the end you get a little bit of kind of like uh, kind of a harder sound. Kind of yeah. Rocket Queen's an inversion of that. Um, I would say I really got into Guns N' Roses, though, after I discovered Use Your Illusion, which, ha which happened. It took me a while to get into, um, but I bought them both at the same time, and I remember being really impressed. It, it took a while to acclimate because I was kind of expecting another Appetite for Destruction. But then when you really listen to the album, it's especially the lyrics. Like I think we'll probably get into this like on a song by song basis, but like the the lyrical quality is really outstanding, and just intelligent too. I mean, you, you saw my Facebook post about Coma. Just right. the amount of lyrics in Coma, and like you said, that last stanza of Coma is so impressive. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's funny because my first experience with Use Your Illusion was actually my cousin and some of our friends were really into get in the ring. Oh yeah. You know, because, cause we were like 10. Yeah. Right. And at that time it was like, wow, so much swearing. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. 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 One of the, one of the weaker songs probably on, on either album, but actually I, I kind of enjoy it too. He's just, he's just so pissed off and so yeah. unabashed. Yeah. And calling people I would totally audience. listen to get in the ring right now. Yeah. Without question. I would probably listen to Get in the Ring before even like Civil War, even though Civil War is a great song, but it's one of it's probably the song off of there, off of Use Your Illusion Two that's been most beaten into the ground for me. Really? God, sweet child of mine of Use Your Illusion Two. Yeah. Uh what's your favorite what's your favorite song off of let's say the first album? Use Your Illusion One. Yeah. Coma, no question about it. But yeah. I mean, uh, Use Your Illusion One is probably more solid top to bottom because yeah. you have Don't Damn Me, Double Talk and Jive, Dust and Bones is a great song. Yeah. Um, all of them are are really good songs. I can listen to that that one just about straight through without without any problem. Actually, November Rain's probably like my least favorite one, even though. I remember when I was 10, I was super into it. Yeah. But again, you know, I'm kind of beating it to the ground, but I still highly, highly enjoy the video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So much, so much cigarette smoking in it. I love that, you know, the, the Axel Stephanie Seymour wedding yeah. and just ridiculous. flashes smoking during it. He walks out for some reason. Out, out in the field playing the guitar out in the, the, field of wheat or whatever yeah and then uh it starts raining and somebody decides to jump through the wedding cake <laughs> yeah i feel like it, it watching it it's almost it's it's hard to start watching for me because it's got that really something unappealing about that like 80s kind of like washed out color and then just like the you know like the rock video over the top kind of decadence but then it sucks you in and if you watch it and you just kind of let it be okay for a minute and you get into it you really start to see man like this is just it, it's just the uh, I mean, I think you have to give the music video enough enough room to be what it is, which is just an opulent, ridiculous visual spectacle to look at while you listen to the song, you know? I mean, you have to understand that at the time that that was released, music videos were really starting to get to the point where it was serious art, and there was a an arms race, really, to see who could make the best music video. Yeah. And that one was right up there, and... I remember in the 90s, and you could probably find this on YouTube, there was like a countdown of the most expensive videos to make, and November Rain was right up there. And it actually kind of jumped the shark when uh, the most expensive video ever was Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson. Uh, was it? No, was it? Yes, yeah, Slam, I think, right? Was their team-up song. Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of a, a dud and then really? I think at that point, everyone decided, all right, let's not try to top how much that costs and let's just make cheaper videos from now on. Yeah, that's funny. I really like Dead Horse, actually. That's one of my favorite. I like his... Um, oh, I like Dead, Dead Horse is wonderful. And I remember, <laughs> I remember when that video came out. I mean, they made videos for Use Your Illusion songs for a solid four years. Really? It was wow. an unbelievable time. Uh, and Garden, the, the Garden and Garden of Eden are both great songs, too. Yeah, the yeah, I was actually reading a little bit about um, the garden yesterday. 
Um, I like Bad Obsession, obviously. I really like the harmonica. I like the, uh, I don't know, I just like how pissed off he is. It's like Mr. Brownstone, but elaborate a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that one, I feel like, is that he, and I kind of get interested in the backstory, you know, because you hear this kind of like um, impression everyone has, like Axl Rose is such a manic and he's such an asshole and he, you know, he's the guy that's responsible for the band falling apart and stuff. But some of the stuff that I was reading is that he was actually really keeping them together and he was uh, kind of um, an artistic genius. And these other guys just kind of wanted to get together and play music. And then they had, uh, I think a lot of them were addicted to heroin or, you know, different things. And, and but he was always, he didn't have a lot of patience for that. And he was kind of like, in the studio working all the time ironically yeah think about it and i mean i i can kind of see where he would and like you know it kind of like a bad attitude in the concerts and stuff like that but i can kind of see where if he's got the stress of keeping these guys together all the time where that would maybe manifest in some things like if you don't know the full context of the behavior it might not make sense to you but i always kind of had an affinity for him i kind of i don't know if, if someone's really good at something i like to give him room to to be a little eccentric but then when you hear about some of the stuff that he was dealing with it starts to make a lot more sense too I mean, he was clearly a genius. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any denying that. It was probably the greatest, you know, some of the greatest music that was, was ever made. It's almost underrated at this point. And, and, I mean, just the list of songs that you just said off of Just Use Your Illusion 1, amazing. Mm -hmm. No one really knows about them. You never hear any of those songs on the radio, but I, I love them. Yeah, because at that time you did hear him on the radio quite a bit and on MTV, maybe not bad obsession, but they made a video for Garden of Eden. They made a video for the garden. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've heard Dustin Bones on the radio on occasion. Yeah, I don't really I, I can't. The only one thing I can think of hearing is Paradise City and uh, Sweet Child of Mine, obviously, and uh, maybe once in a while, My Michelle, but not frequently. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's some, of, it's some of the best, some of the best. And the other thing, too, is people don't like. I always kind of get a little irritated when people review like an ACDC album or it's like, you know, like Rolling Stone magazine or something like that. And they talk about um, Appetite for Destruction being this awesome album. And then they say, well, like Use Your Illusion was more hit or miss. And I just like, do you did you even listen to the album or did you even do any research for that? It just means it's not as well known because in terms of just being a solid, I mean, the amount of good content, like the ratio is outstanding, especially considering how many songs there are. I know. It was a double CD released at the same time. And both of them are like really long. Both of them are quite a bit longer than Appetite. Yeah, 16. And it could um, almost have been three CDs. Yeah. And I, I would have bought all three, no doubt. Yeah, 28 songs total, I think. So, yeah, really could have been like three 10-song albums. I mean, there's a couple on there we could probably do without, but other than you know, like, like my, my world off of uh, Use Your Illusion too. I, I could probably. That, I can't listen to that. That's the one thing that I can't, I literally, I can't listen to that song. I For a long right. time, So Fine kind of weirded me out a little bit and it took me a while actually to get into Estranged. And now I like Estranged, I can tolerate So Fine, but my world, if I accidentally let that start playing, I kind of cringe yeah. and turn it off as soon as I can. And like, it's stuff like that. I mean, maybe it's experimental. I guess that's one of those things about being, you know, I guess maybe if you knew a little bit more about the time or if I was a little bit more cognizant of the context, you know, but I just, I don't understand how someone who, who puts this album together and attacks that on the end. That's strange to me. Yeah. That it could have, no one would have noticed if that wasn't on there. No, that's for no. sure. It could have ended with don't cry the second version, which I think is also really funny that there's two versions of don't cry that are virtually identical, just a slight change of lyric. And I feel like there's probably a story there. Yeah, that is a good question. I would like to hear the story behind that. And yeah, I don't think I could. If you played me the one-off two and asked me which one it was, I probably wouldn't know. Yeah, to tell you the truth, I think it's a Don't Cry is not my favorite, but I, really? that's another one that I do. I think that's probably the best of the the, the th trilogy of videos. That's probably my favorite video. Yeah, I, I actually. I like it quite a bit. I especially like the live versions. I like the live version of Patience too, because I'm really into Axel's weird voice modulation that he does. The thing, not not just like the high register, but the thing where he makes like strange sounds that they don't. You know what I mean? It's not something you ever hear from anyone. I like that, and I especially like it when he does it like in a really emotive song, because it turns it into something that's kind of cool for me. Because I, I guess I don't. I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of like the the emotionally deep stuff. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it when he kind of throws in this just bizarre sound, you know. You know, at the, the end of Don't Cry, where he drags out that, like, one note. Yeah. Which, if you've ever tried, 
Extreme, it is impossible. I'm sure he can't even do it on yeah. his best day, but it's still pretty cool to attempt. I do. I do. I find myself wondering about that just diaphragmatically. Like what, what is his, uh, what's the procedure like, you know, like what would it, like if, if a person, like say a person of average talent or of average vocal ability were to replicate his exact internal process for producing these sounds, how close could they get? What would it actually sound like? Yeah, right. What's your, which do you prefer, knocking on heaven's door or live and let die? Oh, that's a, oh man, that's that's tough. That's really tough. I probably would have to say, in terms of enjoying listening, probably have to say live and let die. I mean, I like knocking on heaven's door a lot, but I really like uh, live and let die. Which yeah, I would, a, probably, I would probably agree with that. Live and let die is, that's a great cover because... Yeah. You know, you really notice a difference when you hear the McCartney version compared to the Guns N' Roses version, even though they're both great songs. Yeah, I kind of feel like, I, and I, I say things a lot of times, I mean, it takes, for some people, I think some people will never say that they like the cover better than the original, but I oftentimes, I, mean, I have no problem with that, and I think Guns N' Roses is pretty consistently the covers I enjoy better than the original. I don't know if you've seen, and in, in, I think it's in... Um, Argentina, they did uh, maybe or maybe like Rock and Rio or something like that. They did um, Dead Flowers, uh, the Rolling Stones, which has always been one of my favorite Rolling Stones songs. But I, I absolutely prefer the live version of Dead Flowers to the uh, to the the Stones original. Oh yeah, and I really really like Sympathy for the Devil, which is on their greatest hits. Kind of talk about that. And it kind of like breaks. It kind of like I think it broke the band because like that's when Axel brought in the other guitar guy, and I don't know Slash got pissed about it or something. But I love that song. Okay, and I like head. it. Yeah, is that is that who it was? <laughs> Probably, right? Yeah, I mean that would have that would have pissed me off too. Um, that's weird. I can't. I don't know. Like, I see, I can tolerate someone being kind of an asshole because they've got like really good talent, but I can't. The weird stuff like that doesn't make sense to me. Um, that greatest hit CD was actually the first present Mary ever bought me. Is that right? Which was fun. That was but, fucking, you know, it's that not was the moment you knew, right? Yeah, she gets me. Yeah, you know, it's not my favorite one though because. It has like all the songs on it that I would like, eh. Yeah. Like again, like I could never hear most of those songs again and be fine with it. I think I bought it. I think I actually bought the just that one song off of iTunes. Um, oh, and I yeah. I listen to that one pretty regularly because I, I really like. I mean, Sympathy for the Devils is a cool song, and then when you combine it with Axel's voice, it's like, oh, this you know, you really believe what you're hearing. On those set lists that we were looking up, they had a couple covers. One of which was uh, the Seeker by the yeah. Who. So I, it was interesting to see. You know, they, they apparently do a lot of covers. Yeah. So I'm excited to to go and and see if they cover something cool. I think he, yeah, he's been known to cover a whole lot of Rosie, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'd I'd really like oh, to see. Nice. Him, yeah, I'd like to see him cover like a lesser known ACDC album, but or a song. But I guess like that's part of like the live thing. I I can't. Well, what about him joining ACDC? What's that about? You know, is that happening? I, I, I absolutely cannot fathom that. I, I just can't see that happening at all. That's one of those things. I was pretty upset about that because I love Brian Johnson. Like, I mean, I like ACDC, but like Brian Johnson's my guy in the band, you know? And so when he wasn't able to tour, like that's shitty. And especially because he can't tour because of this weird problem, he's going to go deaf. It's hard to accept that there's not some kind of technological workaround for that. You know what I mean? Because I saw him and let's see, must have been September in Detroit. And it was great. You know what I mean? He's like a little older, but I actually saw him from the front row, which is a pretty phenomenal experience. I waited wow. outside uh, Ford Fields for like since like eight o'clock that morning um, just to make sure because it was general admission. And I was like so dehydrated. I had been outside <laughs> all day long and I wasn't drinking anything because I didn't want to have to go to the bathroom and lose my spot. Um, so yeah, I remember about the time they hit like, uh, for those of, or, uh, what was it? Let there be rock. It was like an Angus's guitar solo. I was so excited to be there, but there was a part of me that was like, this has got to get over quick. Cause I need water at a, <laughs> like a real, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, have you I ever don't... Had, the, had the opportunity to see Guns N' Roses at all? No. And I actually, I came close to buying tickets because I had a presale, uh, cause I bought the ACDC tickets. They had a, some presale for Guns N' Roses, but I kind of, I'm like a little bit spoiled now. I wanted to be in the front row. And they didn't even have any front row tickets. They had some that were like way far back and they were like two or $300. And I was like, you know, I'm going to maybe wait and see if I can snap some really good ones up later to see what happens. Well, I have some in Chicago if you want them, but uh, I'll actually, cut you a deal. But um, that will be nice. We actually, did you sign up for the Night Train fan club? No. Oh, no, okay. I'm, 
I was just on the uh, like the, the actual Ford Field uh, stadium or whatever. That's where I bought the tickets from originally. We uh, we signed up for the Night Train Fan Club. Yeah, that was a bad bad experience. Really? I don't even know if I should get into it. All right, I'll get into it. Go ahead. So we signed up for it on the condition that there was going to be a pre-sale yeah. for these tickets. So it was 45 bucks. You get uh, access to the pre-sale, you get a t-shirt mm -hmm. and you get like access to message boards or something like whoop -dee, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> yeah. like there, there's a thing called the internet. I think I could find a message board if I want yeah. one for free. Those are the whiniest and the the bitchiest of all the Guns N' Roses fans. The pay the paying message war people. <laughs> I know, right? Those are the, probably the ones that that like sweet child of mine the most. Yeah. So I sign up for this thing. We immediately get on there for the presale, and there's nothing. There's nothing in Chicago. There's nothing in Meadowlands. There's nothing in Foxborough. The only tickets we could find that were feasible for us were in Orlando. And they were way up in the 300 section. Yeah. Like 90 degrees to the stage. Oh man. That's, that's pretty it bad. It was like, it was like, all right, so I'm not getting, you know, we're not getting this obviously. So I kind of just resigned myself. We weren't going to go. So then the next day I get on the horn to the, the fan club to just kind of be like, Hey, can I just have my $45 back and you can keep your t-shirt and yeah. you know, because I didn't really get what I wanted out of this. So I'm on hold for like half an hour with, and it's Ticketmaster. Yeah. You know, it, it's their fan club. It's not like an organic thing. It's Ticketmaster. And they keep me on hold for half an hour, no sign of anything. And the whole time it's playing Sweet Child of Mine, November Rain, or Knocking on Heaven's Door. And I don't know why, but it doesn't play like the whole song either. It plays like the first minute of each one. Yeah. And it's like wicked staticky too. Wonderful. Which I know is, you know, intentional by Ticketmaster to be like, please just hang up and leave the money <laughs> with us. <laughs> so then I like email them and I get get given the run around and finally, you know, Ticketmaster's like, Oh, we can't e we can't refund you. You have to talk to the fan club. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's who I talk to. Yeah. So then I tried going on hold again yesterday when I had nothing to do. And I was on hold for 35 minutes with no, no end in sight. So pretty much just going to have to eat that 45 bucks. And that's, yeah, that is you know, weird. I don't know what's going on with the guns and roses tickets. Cause I, I figured that like, I mean, I checked in like the, the hour that the pre-sale started and, you know, I mean, honestly, like it, it's kind of a big deal. So I would probably, I probably would have paid, you know, three bucks, 300 bucks, 350 for if like a front row or even like general admission pit, like in the very front. Cause like in the ACDC concert it was the whole floor was pretty much general admission. And, you know, yeah. you get there when you get there, but this one, it, it, there, there were like cordoned off sections of general admission. And it was really unclear about where seats are and what, you know, but um, then it was, you know, two or 300 bucks for tickets that were. 15 or 20 rows back and I you know like the the idea that I could have gotten a front row seat and I'm paying more for one that's not front row to me I just I didn't want to get into that so uh that is yeah, disappointing I, I don't know where those tickets went though you know what I'm saying like if they, if they if they've all just been reserved for some kind of some so club or something we went on a, a different pre-sale through city bank oh, yeah. or city card or something yeah and that's how we got the tickets in New Jersey and the tickets in Chicago. So, okay. And then they had like a general like sale too. That was after that, obviously yeah. not pre-sale, but we didn't get any from that. I, so I did actually see guns and roses one time. Oh, you did. Yeah. 2002. It was Axel Buckethead and whoever the heck else. Yeah. None, no original band members. Boston Garden. Uh, snowy December night, I remember. So we take the train in. Uh, and we get there. The opener plays at like 7.30 or something. You're right. And we just sit there. <laughs> and we sit there for hours, literally, just waiting is this waiting. After, after the opener? Yeah. Oh, Just man. Just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> Finally, around 11 o'clock, 
you hear the first chords of Welcome to the Jungle, and they come out and they play. But we took the train in. Yeah. And we were told, you know, the last train out was at, like, 1130. So yeah. we watched, like, watched them play, like, four songs. Pretty sure Mr. Brownstone was one of them. Naturally, for and, you. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then we left early. And then we ended up sitting on the train because the train was like, oh, we'll wait for the for the concert. Oh, man. What? It was... <laughs> It was one of the most disappointing experiences of my whole life. Yeah, that's terrible. I can't believe you left early, uh, even for the train. I think you know, I would have thought that you would have just uh, camped out afterward or something. It was snowing like a yeah. like an sob, like seriously, yeah. like it wasn't like a summer summer night or anything. That's funny that he, that in two thousand two. So this showing up late thing is like a it's like a, a serious thing that happens more often than not. It sounds like. Several yeah. hours later. What's the point of that, do you think? Is that kind of self-importance? Is that just something that he's doing at this point because it's part of the persona? You know, what do you think the... I have no idea. I'm getting it... kind of angry just talking about it. <laughs> well, people do. They get pissed. And that's like I was seeing a couple of comments. I, I shouldn't do this, but, you know, for some reason I can't resist reading the comments on stuff if I'm interested in it. And, you know, and then I say, oh, look at these people. They're so stupid. And, you know, I know. everyone's got an opinion. But I'm thinking, what kind of a masochist am I to be looking at this stuff all the time? And everyone's always complaining about, oh, I'll never see him again. And I, I guess, you know, if I was at a place and I felt really effed over and it literally took three or four hours for the guy to come out and it happens all the time, I can kind of understand why somebody might feel that way. It's just, to me, it's kind of hilarious that it actually is as bad as people make it out to be. I mean, it's not very fun to just, like, sit there in a seat in a stadium oh, for three yeah. hours. Yeah, no, I know. Waiting. <laughs> waiting for waiting for ACDC to get the front row was kind of, was frustrating enough, and that was not their fault. You know what I mean? That was, like, me kind of on my own. Uh, they started on time, you know? Yeah, um, especially when it's, like, if it was like, all right, he's coming out at 11, but you yeah. just got to wait. It was like, he could be out now or now <laughs> or now. So what's he doing? That's the thing. What like, what practically is going on back there? You know, did, did you see a movie you wanted to watch or something like that and said, well, I'm going to watch this before going out? Is it some kind of intense meditative like rehearsal ritual? I don't know. That's a good question. I will say, you know, having been not a big fan of live stuff and uh, knowing that he didn't sound as good live as in the studio i was prepared for him to not sound that good yeah and he sounded amazing is that right yeah well see, there seems to be a lot of variability in his voice actually that was one of the things that i did when i heard all this stuff coming out was um because i first became aware of him still existing in about 2006 like i was looking at pictures this we had like the cornrows and some like unfortunate like uh attire choice it's just kind of funny looking you know um but in the early 2000s he was pretty good right was it comparable to like live era stuff yeah. I mean, he sounded good. It was all good. Yeah. It, you know, it's disappointing. You know, I was such a big, I'm a huge Duff fan. I mm. love Duff. I named my dog Duff. Oh, okay. Like, and to not get to see him is disappointing. And Slash, obviously, unbelievable. Mm. But, you know, technically, Buckethead is probably 95% Slash, I'm sure. But, yeah. you know, it's just He's not got- the same. Yeah, he's got a fucking bucket on his head. I mean, Kentucky, like, I mean, it's it's, just, it's like insulting to everyone. It's got a weird, like, um, I don't know, kind of like weird grunt. I don't really like Slipknot or one of these limp, you know, like just weird. I just like gratuitously bizarre. And that's the connotation it has for me anyway. And I don't really know anything about that. But seeing no, I'm with you. It's, yeah, those are the uh, Marilyn Manson, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, all yeah. that crap porn that... <laughs> that Literally murdered rock and roll. Yeah. And left us in the, the musical desert that we're in right now. Yeah. And then you have next to that, you have Axl Rose. And uh, that's just a weird juxtaposition, I guess. And but and then I was listening to some stuff. Holy shit. Like from the, I don't know, between 2010 and 2012, like his voice, something happened and it was not sounding good. It was like this high squeaky. And I don't know if he had to have some kind of surgery or if he was just, you know, something was going on, but it sounded almost like comical. And I'm not the kind of person that like, I'm ready to like, I mean, if anything, I'll probably be on the defensive side. So it's not that bad. You know, like there's a lot of people who just love the fact that he doesn't sound good, but I was listening to, I was like, wow, this is not something really is going wrong here. You know? Yeah. I'm hoping he sounds okay when we, we see him. It seems like he's getting back. I mean, like, things that are more recent, you know, I would say post 2012, that sounds pretty good. I mean, there's a little, you know, like the, like that first concert that they, he sounded maybe not quite as strong as he did in the past, but it sounded like him anyway. 
it wasn't like uh, it, it sounded like he just kind of like blown a fuse or something there for a while, and it was uh, it just wasn't there. It sounded like a different person, like Mickey Mouse or something like that, you know? Yeah. How do you feel about Velvet Revolver? You know, I don't know much about him. I really don't. I kind of like get stuck in my. I listen to a fair amount of classical music, uh, just like throughout the day. And then when it comes to like working out and stuff, that's usually when I listen to the rock and roll stuff. And it's almost always. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, really. It's pretty much ACDC's full catalog, uh, a little bit of Led Zeppelin and Guns N' Roses. And I really don't stray from that much. And people tell me, like, I have a friend that tells me all the time, I need to listen to, um, um, man, what is it, uh, Iron Maiden? It's really good. Um, and I know oh. that. I freaking uh, love Iron see? Maiden. And everybody who shares my musical taste says I have to listen to it and they love it and everything. But for some reason, I've got this block against like trying out new music. It's just a thing. It just takes me forever to get around to doing it. I want to see Iron Maiden so bad. And we almost drove up to Montreal to see them a couple of weeks ago. And we ended up having to work that weekend and it didn't work out. But I'm going to go see them not too me. long from now. It seems like they tour a ton. I was in front of the people that were in front of me when we were waiting. It's funny. I don't know if you've ever waited all day long outside of a concert, but you like the, the people who are willing to do that are it's an interesting demographic and it's an eclectic group of people. And that's like I was I was kind of like uh, almost just demoralized by how kind of I felt like a guy that was like lined up outside for waiting for a video game to be released or something like that. It, just, it was not what I was used to being around, you know, but some of them were pretty cool. And uh, one guy uh, had been to like 70 Iron Maiden concerts. And it went around like, and all these different, this is what he does pretty much with his life is that he goes around and he films <laughs> them. Um, and so they, they seem to have kind of like that fanatic following. They do tour a ton and they mostly tour uh, Europe and they don't yeah. come to America a heck of a lot and they don't come to Boston hardly at all. I don't know. Uh, their, their lead singer, Bruce Dickinson is uh, very temperamental Oh. And uh, I don't know if something happened in Boston or what, but I'm hoping they, they come around sometime because uh, they're unbelievable. And if you watch the concert footage, mm -hmm. I mean, they have these huge sets and, and they, they take it really seriously. And Bruce Dickinson has an unbelievable voice. Yeah, right. You get a chance. Listen to Flight of Icarus and, and you won't be disappointed. See, that's one that's been that, – yeah. That's and like kind of like similar to Led Zeppelin and the storytelling and the mythology sort of woven in there. Um, th these are these are all things that have been described to me already exactly pretty much like you did. You won't be disappointed. Flight of Icarus has been mentioned specifically, but I don't know. For some reason, I'm recalcitrant. There's a part of me that doesn't want to take anybody's advice when it comes to music. I don't know. But I love it. This is the thing. As soon as I listen to it one time, it, it, it then becomes incorporated into the catalog of stuff that I listen to over and over again. But I don't know. There's that threshold. Something's got to happen just right, you know? Mm-hmm. I really like, uh, I was just looking at uh, Use Your Illusion 2 again. Um, I really like off of that album, I think I told you this, uh, Breakdown probably is my favorite song off of that one, if I had to pick one. I'm a little ashamed to admit that I can't even think of what Breakdown sounds like. Yeah. It's got a whistle introduction, so you know it's going to be good. Any song where he whistles in the beginning, you know? Yeah, there you go. I know, the whistling solo and patience is something I think we've all tried to emulate and failed yeah. at. Yeah, I can't even get like a. I, I'm not. I'm not much of a whistler, I must say. <laughs> but yeah, that's that. There's a really sweet. Uh, like I love good st like stretches of really awesome songs. Breakdown, pretty tied up. I like a lot. And then uh, obviously, the locomotive is a really great one. Particularly when he talks about. Uh, he references use your illusion. I really, really like uh, his discussion about you know using your illusion and, and he's going to hang on to his and all that. So he's worked too hard for his illusion just to throw it all away. And it's like this really like, man, that's like insightful psychology there. Like he's acknowledging that everyone's going around in their own hallucination and he knows that his is just made up too. But it, and it's always, it, it, sometimes I don't know it's, if it's projection or what, but it, you feel like he's talking to his band members. He's talking, maybe there's tension there. He's talking to these apparently like rock and roll magazines used to antagonize him a lot or something. Oh um, yeah. Get in the ring. It's all about that. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Hit Parader. Uh, you should get some back issues of Hit Parader. Really? And just flip through them. I mean, what an unbelievable magazine at the time. Yeah, that's funny. I, it's really interesting to think about. And there's something about it. I mean, I guess it's like the equivalent of social media today, except for it, the, the, the kind of like the smell lingered in the air for longer because it wasn't immediately overtaken by other developments, right? So the, the, the issue would come out making all sorts of allegations or something like that. And then they, they would just kind of, <laughs> 
that would be the news for a, a month or something like that. But yeah, it's interesting. You know, the, one of the things about Guns N' Roses that I find that I kind of like so much and that I try to, if someone's not into them, like, like even uh, Melissa, obviously she's not really, well, I guess not obviously, but she's not into, she tolerates rock music, you know, but it's, it can sound dated. Like for me, I listen to Guns N' Roses and it's so timeless. I'm not even really aware of like, you know, like the car phone beeping and, and knocking on heaven, heaven's door. But I really like how there are aspects of it that really kind of show its age, but there are also aspects of it that, that really uh, transcend that and that are really cool and awesome. Like November Rain is as much of a kind of obstreperous, just uh, uh, self-indulgent rock ballad as there is ever written. But somehow or another, it's also so good that you you not only kind of tolerate that aspect, but I find that it actually is a part of what I like about it, you know? I mean, I, I don't think it's just timeless. I mean, they don't make music like that anymore. They don't make 10-minute songs anymore or 8-minute songs. And, and the thought of releasing an 8-minute song as a video or something is ridiculous. I mean, what's the longest song that's been released in the last 15 years? Yeah, I have no idea. I don't, I'm totally out of the loop of, of contemporary music. I would imagine it is no more than five minutes long. Yeah, at the most. So uh, Guns N' Roses is producing all this music that is six minutes plus, and it, I think in in that regard, that's the way it's most dated. And yeah, they're they're definitely. Uh, what the generation X version of, of Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. where they just have a ton of music, ton of hits, ton of deep cuts that the, the, the real fans like, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, ballads, hard stuff, different, different styles. And, and I mean, even rap songs, like all sorts of stuff. Yeah. I think, uh, you were talking about your favorite off, uh, use your illusion to, Say mine's definitely estranged. I also, Is that you know, right? I I love uh, you could be mine. Oh, yeah. The the end uh, rap of you could be mine. I mean, if that comes on the radio, which it's so awesome that they play that song on the radio. Yeah. If that ever comes on the radio, I have to I have to sing that last part. Yeah, the couch couch trips getting older. I, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Just that anger, and that's the thing too. Like, I mean, I feel like you can. He's the kind of person you don't even have to really be empathetic when you, if you listen to what he's saying, you can immediately relate to the kind of sentiment that's behind those words. And like, even if I'm not, I, I don't have a lot of like um, exper personal experience in my life where I was that frustrated with a woman or frustrated with my romantic situation or whatever, but I can immediately step into and commiserate with what it must be like just to be like frayed beyond all, you know what I'm saying? Like to that point where you're just so pissed and you're so done for whatever reason it won't end and you're just... You, you know, you can imagine him channeling that stuff in there. That's like same thing with one in a million. You know, everyone was, was homophobic and it was racist and all this stuff. And I was like, that song to me, first of all, I love it. I think it's really great. It's that kind of combination of that really. He's got his weird voice in there. He's got like his pissed off thing, and then he's also got this bat, this this chorus that is being sung to somebody himself or you know, I don't know, um, some woman or somebody. Um, and it's so obvious to me that what he's doing is relating metaphorically this experience of kind of just needing to get away from something in Los Angeles or wherever it was he happened to be. And it happens to be from this perspective of a kind of a white heterosexual male in the late eighties. And you know, when people can't, it's, you know what it is? It's like money for nothing. Like when they talk about the little faggot with the earring and the makeup, you know, and it's like, everyone's like, Oh my God, he said faggot. But it's like, it's, he's totally like a blue collar. The funny worker. thing is until like two years ago, no one cared. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> But the thing they played about it on the radio forever and ever with yeah. no problem. Well, so they're like, wait, what is he saying? Yeah, 2013 is I think when all this stuff really started to get like PC stuff. You no, know, and money for nothing too. And I'm glad that you like Dire Straits because I love Dire Straits. And money for nothing, he's kind of making fun of the idea that somebody yeah. would say that. But well, yeah, but still now it's like, oh my god. Well, because yeah, because it's a total reflex reaction, and it is. He's obviously like a blue collar worker moving around appliances in the store, and he's referring to, and that's how people. T I mean, that's how that kind of person. Uh, you know, there there are people out there who kind of catch. They're not bad people. They don't necessarily hate homosexuals, but they do use that kind of terminology. And it, it, like I, as a six or seven year old kid, I remember I could immediately. I understood exactly what this guy was talking about in the song, and I wasn't fixated on that part. I was listening to it, thinking about 
yeah, the, the lifestyle that this man's communicating sounds good to me. I remember being like a little kid listening to that, like, yeah, that's what it's going to be like when I grow up. That, that, that's, the, that's, that's what I want. That's cool, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, not to mention the fact that the guy who apparently, you know, who's, who's the victim of this term is, is apparently has a jet that's his, you know? Um, yeah. But, yeah, one in you a million. Know, I know. Uh, there's so much misogyny in Guns N' Roses. I mean, one of my favorites off Use Your Illusion 1 is actually Back Off Bitch. I just oh. think it's, a, it's an awesome song, but I mean, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's such a pity that you're such a bitch, right? It's that, but see, that's the same kind of thing, yeah. too, that like it's easy to get hung up on, oh, that's a man talking about a woman. No, it's not. It's a man talking, or it's, a, it's an individual talking about somebody who he's been in a relationship with, maybe he's made himself vulnerable to, and that person has time and time again effed him over. You know what I'm saying? And like, if, if a, a woman were interested in, in like empathizing with that experience, she totally could. There has been like the, the prototypical female male version of that sentiment and of that feeling. And when you listen to it in that way, I'm like, I, you know, the concern with misogyny in music is, I, I think, I don't know. I don't know if the average person responds differently to it than I am, but I listen to a song like Back Off Bitch, and it's like, at, first of all, it gets me really like motivated to go work out. That's pretty much it. And I really, there's, I don't think of any woman in my life because I've never allowed myself to get so angry about uh, a relationship that like I literally am thinking about something like that. You know, it's just a good song. It's taking that negative energy and that negative emotion and, and channeling it into, I think, um, um, a productive or, you know, an artistic expression that anybody. You know, I would... think most of them are about either uh, the way Izzy feels about. Axel or Axel feels about Izzy. I mean, I know 14 years is about that, which that's that actually right? one of my favorite ones off Use Your Illusion too. I love that song. That is a good one. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. So a lot of those are there kind of like they're seeking back and forth to each other. Yeah. And I shared a, a live version of Night Train on Facebook there and, and Axel like introduced the band, mm -hmm. which was fascinating just in its own little right and, and he mentioned izzy and he's like we've been together 13 years so it's something that they were really hung up on it was like counting how many years they've been together which i yeah. find very interesting also one of the other videos i watched of live uh night train was uh axel was wearing a marlboro t-shirt uh -huh. like marlboro cigarettes which it's funny because in the early 90s, you know, people wore like cigarette paraphernalia. And now I think that would be like the equivalent of then wearing a, a shirt that said like the N word or something on it. I think right. if someone saw that now, they would have the same reaction as that then. Yeah, uh, that, that is pretty funny how, how suddenly things like that have changed. And it's like the interesting thing to me is, that, is it probably a good thing that that's not as popular now as it was then? Yeah. But what, what cost have we paid in terms of being regimented culturally? I think we've paid a tremendous cost and, and not, and, and that's the thing that I think people don't really, that's if you, if I feel nostalgic for like the nineties or for what, what I perceived life to be like when I was younger, it's for that. It's for the fact that you're less monitored and that you're less kind of restricted in what you're allowed to do. At the same time, I appreciate not having to deal with secondhand smoke as much as, as was around at that time. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's funny, like, um, I just I keep looking through the the song list and I see other ones I like like right next door to hell is a really sweet song like the the opener and the oh, yeah. thing that I, I again like I feel like he pulls out the most uh, lyrically astute and insightful things at the end like the very last things that he says in these songs you can tell he wants to end on this profound note and I really like that part about not sad kids just lucid ones like actual Rose says lucid in a rock song and I, I something I just appreciate that you don't I don't I don't think I've ever heard lucid in a rock song except for there. He had a tremendous vocabulary for sure, especially on Use Your Illusion 1 or 2. Yeah. And how do you feel it, about the spaghetti incident? You know, uh, I, I don't know how I, <laughs> how I feel about it. I feel weird about it. Uh, the only song that I've listened to extensively off that one is, um, what's the ballad? Um, Since I Don't Have You? Yeah, I've listened to that one. Mostly just because I feel like I, I, I kind of had a reference point and use your illusion for that kind of like for that kind of thing. The rest of it, that's, I, that's the I, one they made a video for. Really, a video for that one, yes, which would be their last video. Right, um, but I, yeah, the rest of it I really haven't gotten into. What about you? I think uh, well, at the time that that came out, Hair of the Dog, the mm -hmm. Nazareth cover, that was pretty big, uh, pretty big hit. Mm -hmm. And and my favorite one was. Uh, 
Buick McCain, mm -hmm. I believe, which uh, ends with a, a barrage of, of f words, which oh is always a good time. I'm gonna have to give that. A, I'm gonna have to give that a look. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely I, check that out. It's interesting. I feel about that one kind of the way I feel about uh, Coda from Led Zeppelin. It's got that same kind of. Um, you don't really know what to think about it. It seems like it's cobbled together. It seems it, it feels, I don't know. It feels obligatory. Maybe it feels, uh, yeah. there's something about it that's hard, makes it hard to approach. And I mean, even the fact that it's called the spaghetti incident and it's got this, have you heard the story about what that's supposed to be about? No. I think it was Axel actually threw a bunch of spaghetti at a producer or somebody. This is, this is someone had spaghetti thrown at them and this was like a funny reference to whatever that was. Um, Sounds about right. And I guess discussing that one kind of brings up the topic of Chinese democracy. Uh, <laughs> Never heard one second of it. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, good I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. And when we were looking up that set list last night, yeah. Chinese democracy was one of the songs they played, which yeah, ton of balls there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like... Um, there's all I, these I people that paid to not hear anything from Chinese <laughs> Democracy. That's a, it's a bizarre album. It's one of those things that, that it's the most expensive album ever produced. It's like I think it was fourteen million dollars to make it. Um, I think that the record company paid for eight million, and uh, the rest of it, it was Axel. And it was and a lot of this payment was being in the studio. I think it was just studio time, you know. And then I remember I bought it. It was only released from Best Buy, and it came out, and I got it like two thousand eight. Like the, as soon as it came out, I went and got it because I thought. You know, this has got to be great. How can it not be great? And I listen to it, and I don't like. I still, I try to listen to it, and I'm like, you know, this is not, this is not what I want to hear from you. I don't know. It's just, and it, I, I mean, I hear your voice here and there, and it's like, oh, that's cool. I like that voice, but then it's this weird kind of industrial kind of grunge. I don't, I don't even know if this is the accurate terminology. This is kind of the, the connotation that it has for me, though. Um, and I can't. I literally can't listen to it. Not one song. I mean, you know, it's funny because it came out in '08. When I went to see them in 2002, yeah. we had known for like a couple of years yeah. that they were going to release an album called Chinese Democracy. Yeah. So, I mean, it was something that went from like, oh, okay, that's going to come out to, oh, yeah, haha, ha, Chinese Democracy, that's going to actually ever be released. And then it got released, and, then it was, and everyone was like, oh, man, nah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, the buildup was it. Someone said that, um, I guess, in the period in between. Like the spaghetti incident, and when they actually finally break, because I didn't realize this that they didn't announce their breakup until 1996. They stopped touring for Use Your Illusion in '93, and then there's this long three or four year period where they're just not active, and it's kind of like, well, they're gonna make another album. What's going on? And, you know, you kind of get this ambiguous feedback. But apparently, at one point or another, they were actually in the studio recording stuff. And there's this idea that they've got a ton of like recorded stuff that's never been released. Um, and then I guess there were some tensions about. I don't know. Uh, so they brought in other guitar. Axel wanted to bring in other musicians, and stuff kind of got heated. And then, and then Slash left, and pretty much when he left, that was you know what I mean. That's that's pretty much uh, the end of the band as it was, I think. But yeah. did you ever hear Duff's solo album that was released in 1993? I didn't. Oh, uh, is it good? It's got some good stuff on it. Yeah. He's not like a great singer, but yeah. there's some soul there. Is that right? Yeah, it's called Believe in Me, and uh -huh. the, title, the title track is very good, and there's also a song on there called uh, Fuck You that is also oh. very good. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay. Oh. It was House housekeeping. I housekeeping. Guess, but, uh, <laughs> we're of obviously course. in the middle of more important things. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I really like Perfect Crime, too, off of uh, – I'm pretty much, we're just, we're just go through the list of all the songs. Yes. On both albums and say, I really Perfect like Crime song. is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I just I forgot the a song. Yeah, I really, I don't know. I like it when I, I like through it when, like a perfect crime phase. I've been through like a perfect crime phase, a don't damn me phase, a back off bitch phase. Yeah. Garden, Garden of Eden. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm know. currently in a, a like a four or five year long coma phase. <laughs> yeah, coma will be that way, you know. It's I might come back around in November rain. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? I, I really like yeah, I like it when Axel says motherfucker. That's what it is. That, that's why I like Mr. Brownstone. That's why, you know, perfect crime. I mean, you're just listening and there's just this uh I don't know, there's something about the combination of the way his voice sounds and the and, the, and how emphatic he is in his speech that is just it's The way just, someone says motherfucker is is pretty awesome. Yeah. It's like uh you know the movie Blow? <laughs> yeah. 
Remember when Penelope Cruz yells motherfuckers at like the whole party? Cause she oh, yeah. like do a ton of cocaine. Like that is so awesome. Yeah. It's funny. I was just actually yesterday watching the movie uh, Vacation, the new like National Lampoon Vacation movie uh-huh. with Ed Helms and, that, and Chris, Christina Applegate. Is that kind of like Chinese democracy? Yeah, right. Christina Applegate yells motherfuckers and it's like perfect. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's true. It's a great word. And uh, oh yeah, it's very yeah. It it, it kind of captures the uh, a certain feeling. How do you feel about Gina or lies? Uh, patience is fine. I mean, it's definitely not my favorite. Yeah, I think it probably has the best cover. Yeah, definitely. Like, like the cover of the album that is. You know what I mean? Yeah, I listen to the studio half, the second half, a lot. I like uh, move to move to the city, uh, the live version. I like a lot, the extended one. I really like. Uh, I used to love her. I like that one a lot. I must say because it's so upbeat. I like the combination of the kind of upbeat tempo with the uh, incredibly uh, macabre uh, subject matter. I Bobby really. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, you know. Oh yeah, that yeah. It seems I like think maybe it says it on the on the album. I don't know. I've. I've I know I heard that somewhere. It's like a joke, you know? Yeah, right. I really, really like uh, the acoustic version of You're Crazy. I prefer that to the to the uh, the other one. Um, that's probably oh, my favorite yeah. one. I actually like both versions. Really? That's an underrated little yeah. song. Well, well, you know, the reason I like the acoustic version is because he says motherfucker, and he doesn't say that in the in the live one. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, One in a Million, I'm a big fan. I, I like that. I don't know. There's something about – there's a certain uh, – emotional state that I'll be in a, like the end of a long day or something like that. And I just need to come home and I listen to, to one. It makes me feel better. Mm. Actually, you know, you know, double talk and jive probably has the best version of motherfucker. Oh, absolutely. Of course. That's the gold standard, right? <laughs> we, should, we should rate those actually. I think we should do another podcast and it should be the, 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 the top uses. Yeah, I would like to just sit here and name more times that motherfucker has been used in pop culture. I think we <laughs> might have named them all. Yeah. Uh, this, right, did you ever watch the show Boss with uh, Kelsey Grammer? I did not. Oh, it's okay. No one else did either. Uh, it was on Stars. Uh, it was actually really, really good. He's the mayor of Chicago. And um, <laughs> it, he it, like the... The, he basically is the mayor, and he wants to stay the mayor, but he's got this progressive dementia. He's got Louis body dementia, and so he's starting to have hallucinations and all this stuff. And he hallucinates at one point in the show. There's this pothole in the street, and he gets out, and he's screaming about this pothole to his driver, and his driver's confused. He doesn't know he has this problem, you know? And he's in the middle of Chicago, in the middle of, and he says, I'm the goddamn mayor of this motherfucking city, and I want this hole fixed now. And it's just a hilarious. It's worked its way into, like, the... Uh, <laughs> And to the the things that I'll just say throughout the day, you know. So occasionally, like I'll just oh, turn nice. to Melissa and start yelling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well timed and well placed emphatic profanity. It really does enrich, I think, your life experience. You know what I mean? Like if you if you apply it appropriately, it's key. Absolutely. Um, I think we've probably gone a good long time on this. I I know. Like I said, I could probably talk for another three hours. Yeah. We'll probably do a, an episode two. This could Absolutely. be like, this, this is Use Your Illusion 1. We'll do Use Your Illusion 2. That sounds good, but hopefully there won't be a My World at the end of it. <laughs> there probably will be. It's probably <laughs> tough to put out a whole double album without ending and with the last one being terrible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I, I've enjoyed it, though. It's been fun. And, I, and I'm sure that this is going to trigger a ton of other stuff that I wanted to talk about just on the subject alone. Absolutely. Maybe in a year from now, we'll have to do one about Iron Maiden once you give me, yeah. give me some time. Awaken to that. You know, I will say, you know, Iron Maiden, I didn't get into them until uh, between 2003 and 2007. I really discovered what Iron Maiden was all about. And it was yeah. really 2007. So I was a little bit older. So you're allowed to, to discover them late. Okay. Take some time and ease into it. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. All right. Well, signing off. Okay. See you in a while. All right. Bye-bye.